DiscerningHearts.com presents St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. Mike Aquilina is a popular author working in the area of church history, specializing in patristics, the study of the early church fathers. He is the executive vice president and trustee of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, a Roman Catholic research center based in Steubenville, Ohio. He is a contributing editor of Angelus Magazine and a general editor of the Reclaiming Catholic History series from Ave Maria Press. He is the author or editor of more than 50 books, including St. Joseph and His World, the book on which this series is based. He has hosted 11 television series on the Eternal Word Television Network and is a frequent guest commentator on Catholic Radio. St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome back, Mike. Thanks for having me back, Chris. I can't get enough of St. Joseph in his world. Again, I've said it over and over again. This book that you've written for us, this incredible portrait, I've never viewed St. Joseph quite like this. And I have read several books on him, and they are all very good. But this one, I feel like I'm, I'm walking the path with him. Hmm. Well, I'm glad. That's my intention. I wanted to give people an imaginative entry into a world they would not otherwise know. It's a strange world. It's a different world. We have to make almost a heroic effort to get beyond our contemporary times with its artificial light and its instant communications technology. All of these things that we have that were not even dreamed of in that period. So we have to think about the lives of these biblical figures in a way that requires effort. We have to get out of our own rut and, uh, and to think about what their daily life was like. It was far different from our own. You know, to, to think of a world without electric light, to think of a world without electricity at all, without any kind of power like that. You're talking about a much different world. And that's especially the case in terms of travel. Today, we can save up our money and plan to make a trip overseas and get our passport and all of that stuff. And we can travel miles and miles, thousands of miles in the course of a day. We can bounce around the globe and see many different countries over the course of a week. This is a remarkable thing that we can do today. It was not so easy in the ancient world. Travel was something that was very difficult. It was arduous. It was dangerous. And it was it was hard to plan. Yeah, you, you really couldn't just, you know, of course, jump in a car with your air conditioning or even your windows roll down and go fast so the breeze is blowing on you. And then halfway down the, the way, stop at a truck stop and sit down, cool off in the air conditioned place. <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean to get, I trivialize that when no. I say that, but it, it's, uh, we fail to sometimes appreciate exactly what they experienced. Yeah, I, I'm going to, going to date myself by saying this, but I can remember traveling to Europe without a cell phone, right? Uh, oh, yeah. I, I can't imagine now traveling to Europe traveling overseas without a cell phone by which I can check in with my family whenever I wanted to. This has become unthinkable for me in just the course of a couple of decades. Now, that kind of communications was impossible way back then. If a close family member died, you might not find out about it for many months or a year. So that's the kind of um, isolation you undertook when you were traveling far, as the Holy Family did when they were fleeing Herod. You know, that journey was likely more than a thousand miles. Oh, my goodness. And that's in our conversation in a previous episode. We talked about Joseph being told in a dream by an angel that he had to get up and go. Mm -hmm. I mean, immediately his family was in danger. Yeah. And as you point out, they had no time to prepare. I mean, they had to pick up and go. Right. And they couldn't take much with them, you know. So he probably had a route in mind. You know, we've spoken before about how Joseph grew up in the carpenter's trade. Well, as a carpenter, his skills would have been in demand at many construction sites because mm -hmm. Herod was known for 
his decades-long building boom, so carpenters were much in demand. Joseph would have traveled for work, so he would have known the roads, the main roads through the land. He could have quickly calculated what he needed to do, plotted their course, decided on where they were going to go. But then you set out and you just hope for the best because it's not like you can make hotel reservations. It's not like you can see in the dark and and we can be sure that they were doing most of their travel, their open travel by night because it would have been a very dangerous thing to have a couple traveling with a young child when Herod was looking for a couple with a young child. So yes, they would have had to make all of these decisions on the spur of the moment, and they probably could not have taken much with them. So they had to just trust that God would provide. Well, for many of us who have ever had to take a long road trip, there's also a very real concern of at the stops that we have to make or some way, if something happens, we would be vulnerable to possible thieves. Yes, who would try to harm us. Most of us don't have the government chasing us. And then on top of it, that just the peril of dealing with people who would try to harm us to be able to take the little we might have. Yes. And that was a very real concern at that time. That's one reason why the Jewish synagogues always provided hospitality to Jews who were traveling, because it gave them the circumstances they need to observe ritual purity. They were able to remain faithful to the law in their difficult circumstances in travel. They could stay there at the synagogue. They could have a kosher meal. They could be safe from bandits, and they could move forward to the next stop. It's quite likely that Joseph Joseph found his family refuge in the synagogues along the way from the Holy Land to Egypt as they made their journey. Yeah, there was a person, his name is Perry, as you mentioned in the book, who actually went and tried to navigate the path that they might have taken. Uh, Well, yes, because we do have some evidence from the New Testament record. But also, when you consider that journey in the context of everything else we know from history at that time, well, you can start to piece it together. In addition, there are many traditions that have been preserved in Egypt and along the way about the Holy Family's flight, because the local peoples presumably would have considered this a memorable event. Perhaps something extraordinary happened when they met the divine child. This would have been a memory that they treasured in their region. Now, these traditions don't come down with the same reliability that we we find in Holy Scripture, but, you know, we can consider them. When we look at the map they do seem to make sense. You know, it's likely that Joseph took the Holy Family southward from Nazareth and then cut over westward to hug the shore of the Mediterranean, to go along the roads that were there along the shore of the Mediterranean. And probably the immediate destination would have been the land of the Nabataeans, because at that time, those people were in conflict with Herod. Herod wanted to take over their territory. He wanted to just absorb them into his kingdom, and they resisted it mightily. They wanted to maintain their independence. So they would have been averse to Herod, unlikely to do him any favors by hunting down a Jewish family who were traveling with a young child. So they went through the land of the Nabataeans, again, hugging the shore of the Mediterranean, the roads that were there along the shore. And of course, You need roads along the shore that way because a lot of your goods are coming in by sea. So that's a very important thing. So they went through that land of the Nabataeans until they got to Egypt. They crossed what was called the Egypt River, which was a a small little creek by comparison with some of the great rivers that they would see along the way. But they crossed that, and that was the border between the kingdom and Egypt. This would have been the reasonable route to take because of the because of the roads, because of the synagogues along the way, because of the geopolitical situation of the Nabataeans. All of these things make sense of the tradition that we've received. Well, and I want to just allude to a, the previous episode that we had on angels. Is it possible, Mike, for us to, with a certain confidence, 
believed that those who would encounter the Holy Family as they're going along may have been influenced or encouraged by angels to welcome them, to help them. I mean, this is the Son of God here. You know, if you think the angels in some ways might have paved the way, especially in these communities that believed in their presence. I think this is the way our everyday life goes forward. You hope to be guided to the people who will be most disposed to help you. And the angels can help us in those meetings, in those encounters. So, so yes, I think that there was that element to it. It is interesting that they chose to flee to Egypt and not to Babylon, for example, where Joseph's immediate ancestors probably came from. You would think that they'd have connections there, too. But I believe that they chose Egypt for a very good reason. There was a sizable Jewish population there. The Jewish population in Egypt at that time was about 4%, which is about the percentage of population of the United States right now who are Jews. So there would have been a sizable Jewish population there. They lived in enclaves there, and they kept their own neighborhoods where it would have been easy for a family to observe the law and to observe ritual purity. There were, as we know, also groups of the Essenes there in Egypt. They were known as the Therapeutae. And so they would have been disposed to follow the norms of Judaism, the life of a Jew, the way it's possible that Joseph was accustomed. So yes, he chose Egypt because it was a place where he could raise his son in the way that God wanted, in the way that was traditional for his people. So he's showing the prudence of a good father there in choosing the destination. And of course, he's going on the council of angels as well, and and you can't beat that. You also ponder how long they might have been there. I think it was really quite beautiful that you went back to find that possible answer in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 6. Yes, because there, you know, we're given a precise number of days that the lady who is shown to be in labor with the divine child, the Messiah who will rule all nations, we're given a precise number of days that she was forced to flee, that she was in hiding. And it's quite possible that that number corresponds to the number of days that the Holy Family was in exile, that they were away from their homeland. We don't know because we're not certain of the birth date of Jesus, and we're not certain of the death date of Herod. There's a lot of scholarly argument that goes back and forth about when these events occurred, but it was quite likely at least a couple years. We'll return to St. Joseph and his world with Mike Aquilina in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, Tune in and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. From a letter from St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Be strengthened in the Lord in the might of his power. Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness on high. Therefore, take up the armor of God so that you may be able to resist the evil every day and stand in all things perfect. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of justice and having your feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace, in all things taking up the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all fiery darts of the most wicked one. 
and take for yourself the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. With all prayer and supplication, pray at all times in the Spirit, and be vigilant in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology is a nonprofit research and educational institute that promotes life transforming scripture study in the Catholic tradition. Founded by Dr. Scott Hahn and with current Vice President Mike Aquilina, the Center serves clergy and laity, students and scholars with research and study tools, from books and publications to multimedia and online programming. The St. Paul Center welcomes you to their free online studies. Whether you're studying scripture for the first time, looking to take your studies to a higher level, or whether you're ready for advanced training, you've come to the right place. In addition, for each track of study, they recommend books that will enhance your study in prayer and build your library of essential works in biblical theology and spirituality. The studies are free. Just visit SalvationHistory.com to view a complete library. We now return to St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilino. We've kind of discussed this before, but I think it's important to break it open here. The message to Joseph to pick up and bring the family back home. But where would that home be? I mean, of course, Nazareth. But even then, it takes a lot. Once you've settled in and you, you can imagine he's gotten settled, he, he doesn't know how long he's going to have to stay. And he probably had, had gotten himself prepared to be there for a longer haul. Well, yes, it, it was certainly uh, indeterminate. You know, when they arrived, he probably had to consider whether he would spend his whole life there in Egypt. You know, he had to find work and he had to work one day as if he was going to be there the next day and the next week. In fact, when you take on a job as a carpenter, you have to be thinking ahead. But again, With the guidance from the angels, he was able to discern the right things to do in the immediate future, and he was able to find his way back. And of course, he did find his way home. He was able to avoid particular dangers because of the way the Romans divided up the kingdom after the death of King Herod. The Romans began to see Herod as a loose cannon, a figure who had become far too powerful on the world scene. And so once he died, they divided up his kingdom among several of his heirs so that instead of having one large, powerful kingdom there, you had several small, weaker kingdoms there, each one ruled by a different uh, heir of King Herod. Now, a concern for Joseph would have been the dispositions of that particular heir. Was this one as murderous as his father? And since Joseph did not know these people personally, he was probably very grateful and and quite dependent for that counsel of the angels. It's interesting because people have always wondered what would have been like, because now we have, before we've been talking about St. Joseph and his interaction with the Blessed Mother and preparing for this incredible event, an incredible gift to everyone, this child. But now this is the time they're living with the baby who is growing into that toddler years. What was it like? What was, I mean, here's the son of God. What would it have been like? And in the ancient world, they had the infancy gospels. And of course that's not canonical, but we just don't know. Yeah. I mean, you can see that even those infancy gospels uh, show that certain curiosity that's there in Christians. We desire to know about those hidden years. We want to know what their family life would be like, because we'd like to use it as a model for our family life. So the popes and the saints have encouraged us to undergo this imaginative exercise in our prayer with the scriptures in our hands, trying to understand what that life would have been like. Now, some of those infancy gospels from antiquity are just awful, you know, and they really do portray Jesus and Mary and Joseph in a light that is not flattering and not orthodox. So, you know, imagination can go wrong (laughs) and can go (laughs) awry. Uh, We want to make this a prayerful exercise, not just for our entertainment. We want to make it a prayerful exercise and one that is grounded in what we know from history. 
grounded in the scriptural record, which we know to be reliable because it's revealed and inspired by God. This goes beyond in a very real way what people might experience on a Camino, <laughs> you know, in Spain, a pilgrimage by foot. This is truly a pilgrimage that is being lived out in the moment, isn't it? I mean, it is. Look at them, and you've led a lot of pilgrimages, Mike. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I like to imagine what their family life is like. And I like to think of its ordinariness because during that time, Joseph would have been raising Jesus for his trade. Joseph would have been raising Jesus gradually, empowering him, enabling him to take on the, the full yoke of the law, because that's what was normal in a childhood. You encouraged your child to grow in the practice of the religion. You encouraged your child to grow in his practice of his profession. And there was a saying among the rabbis, if you don't teach your child a trade, you're teaching him to steal. You know, because what do you do if you can't get a job? Well, you know, that's this is the kind of illicit work you'd fall back on. So Joseph raised his child with a trade in the family business. It's pleasant to imagine Jesus growing up gradually in both the practice of his religion, but also in the practice of this trade. What are the projects he would have been working on when he was very small? you know, sweeping up the floor, making small hand tools, making small toys for other children, that sort of thing. And then what would he have grown into as he gained more dexterity with his hands? What would he have grown into as he gained more strength in his arms and he could lift beams and hold them in place for his father while his father trimmed them or fitted them together? These are the things that our Lord would have had to learn to do as he grew in wisdom, age, and strength, as St. Luke's Gospel tells us. This is just a, a little bit of a, a moment in the life of St. Joseph and Mary and the child. The first time he had to leave them to go find work, or he had to leave them to find food. Can you imagine what that might have been for him? I mean, maybe you can better than anybody, Mike, because you're uh, such a wonderful dad yourself. But the fact, all children are important and they're all dear to us. But for Joseph, this is the son of God too, that he's been entrusted. And just the ache in his heart to have to leave them even for an hour or two. <laughs> that would have been very difficult. It is hard enough for me when I have to undertake business travel and, and be away from home. But in his case, because he had that experience of the family's vulnerability when they were very small, it, it would have been especially hard, I think, because you always have a, a kind of a, a remnant of that, I think, in your makeup. You're always just a little worried about it, worried that perhaps one of the heirs of Herod will be seized by the paranoia of Herod and will act upon it or that the family might encounter some other danger. So yeah, when any man leaves his family like that, it's a difficult thing. I would imagine that Joseph, knowing what he would have been entrusted to his care, would have been especially cognizant of that. Yeah, I mean, he's dealing with potentially something of great anxiety, mm -hmm. incredible anxiety. And yet, because of his faith, it doesn't necessarily make the anxiety or the, the conditions what could cause it, but it gives him the grace to make it yes. and to do it. And I think that's something that we all could really ponder and draw from, especially in our day, don't you think, Mike? Yes. I mean, what do we know about St. Joseph? We know that he consulted the angels, and we know that he acted. We have none of his words recorded in the New Testament, but we have deeds, and, and they're, they're heroic deeds, they're mighty deeds, they're, uh, you know, this undertaking of a great journey, this flight from the all-powerful Herod, all of these things that he did, he did decisively after consulting with heaven, with the angels. So yes, I think there's a model in there for us as we go forward in life, exercising prudence as he did, and having recourse to the graces that have been given us, especially the grace of our guardian angel. Uh, any final thoughts on this particular chapter, Mike? I think it's good for us 
to take a look at the real history surrounding the flight to Egypt, because it's different from the way most people imagine it. You know, we often imagine them as walking into a pagan land that was just chock full of idols, where they would have been utter strangers. And it's not exactly that way. You know, they probably were able to find uh, an enclave of their kin there, certainly their, their fellow Jews, and they were able to practice their religion with others and speak a language that was familiar to them. And they were able to have encouragement in keeping a faithful home and keeping a kosher home. So I think it's not the way a lot of people imagine it. It wasn't as utterly foreign as we imagine it to be, projecting scenes we know from movies like The Ten Commandments or Prince of Egypt. They were probably able to find a home there that, that felt like home, that they were probably able to find community there that really felt like community. And they were probably able to have something approximating a normal family life. And St. Joseph gets at least some of the credit for that because of his prudent decisions made with the guidance of heaven. That is an incredible point, Mike, because I think even today, a lot of times when we say, look to the Holy Family, try to emulate the Holy Family in your home, we think of that time, that quiet time in Nazareth. And yet, when you think they're the holy family in their having to deal with migrating and trying to find work and uh, suffering, you know, a, a, an incredible, stressful, potentially a stressful period where what will we do? How will we do this? If we can emulate them in that because. Most families will at some point experience that as well. Yes, absolutely. We live in a, in a time of great social mobility. Many, if not most people, will not die in the town where they grew up or the town where they were born. You know, we tend to bounce around uh, looking for work, looking for a better place for our family, trying to uh, to find a way forward. And we have a great degree of mobility. So a lot of people will undergo these stresses. A lot of fathers, a lot of mothers will have to make these life decisions, these career decisions. Well, we can go forward knowing that we have a good model in the Holy Family. We can go forward as we know they did. Again, consulting heaven, relying on the angels, and exercising the virtue of prudence, not acting impulsively, but acting decisively when we need to. Such wise counsel. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. I'm enjoying this conversation. You've been listening to St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. To learn more about this subject, you can purchase the book St. Joseph and His World, on which this series is based. Visit scepterpublishers.org, the website for the publisher, Scepter Publishers. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it in the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of the Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will please pray for our mission, and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support our effort. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina.